Good afternoon. Oh, no. Yeah. No, not quite good afternoon. Welcome to this month's Certainty Expert webinar. We'll shortly be conducting a sound check before introducing Edward and Paul, and we'll be with you very shortly. Good afternoon all and welcome to this month's Certainty Expert webinar. I'm Julia Shabhansky, Client Project Director here at the Certainty the National Will Register. We are pleased to welcome for the first time Edward Cumming QC of 24 Chambers and Paul Hewitt, partner at Withers Global Law Firm, who will be co-presenting this month's webinar entitled Deputy and Attorney Abuse, Warning Signs, Prevention and the Role of the Will. For those of you who are new to what we do here at the National Will Register, may I just remind you of the following. Certainty provides will search services for missing, unknown, or later wills of deceased test testators and increasingly for living testators who are applying for statutory wills or are carrying out their responsibilities as an attorney or deputy and need to apply for access to their donor or client's will. We not only search the National Will Register, but we can also search for non-registered wills in areas where the test data used to live or work throughout the UK, including Scotland, Northern Ireland, and including searches with professional will writers from IPW, IPWS, and FWW, and at storage facilities such as the National Will Archive and National Will Safe. We can now begin, and should you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the comments box. 
and let us know who you are and where you're from, and Edward and Paul will try to answer as many questions as time allows. I wanted to introduce this webinar personally. The topic of LPAs and deputyships is something that people like me, the baby boomer generation, are increasingly having to understand as we become responsible for look looking after elderly parents. This is me and my mother, who was kindly given permission to be a poster parent for this topic. I wanted to start the webinar off on a personal note. I am the carer for my elderly parents, and the issues that we will be covering today are very real, both professionally and personally, not just for me, I'm sure, but for many of us on the webinar today. So as we become an increasingly aging population, prone to illnesses such as dementia, and with the number of LPAs and deputyships set to increase, for some there may be a sense of entitlement, or early inheritance syndrome as some call it, giving rise to potential abuse of those deputy and attorney powers, whether inadvertently or intentionally. Add to that mix the complexities of family life and relationships today, then you have situations that will only continue to attract media attention on the potential travesties perpetrated by a combination of all these issues. Indeed, COVID-19 has well and truly induced a media frenzy around the care community and the plight of our elderly population and their treatment. Private client matters are well and truly in the spotlight. It is important to us at the National Will Register to provide increased content on court of protection matters in our eminent expert webinar and articles program for 2020. As we too see an increase in deputy and attorney will search inquiries. In fact, in the first four months of this year, we have already dealt with 83% of total inquiries we received in 2019. So, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our two speakers, Edward Cumming QC, who um, we had a little bit of a debate before the webinar started. He's far too modest to tell everyone that he is the youngest silk in 70 years. Edward is said in Chambers and Partners to be a lion in court and a superstar in the making. He's probably too modest to say all of that too. Um, and has exception, exceptional experience of contentious probate and estate litigation which form, forms a key part of his thriving mixed chancery and commercial practice. He's recommended by Chambers 2020 as leading QC in no fewer than seven separate practice areas. He has particular experience of probate and court of protection cases involving abuse of the elderly. And to Paul Hewitt, Paul is top ranked and described in the directories as a star litigator and formidable opponent. He specializes in all types of trust and probate disputes, including claims about the validity, construction, and ratification of wills and trusts, 1975 Act claims, and removal of executors and trustees. These include uh, statutory will applications and disputes over the appointment or conduct of, it, of attorneys. Paul is also listed in this year's The Lawyer Hot 100. So over to you, Edward. Good morning, everybody tuning in. Um, the focus of our webinar this morning is something of a hot topic. Just um, two weeks ago, a well-known daily newspaper that I'm simply going to call for the purposes of this webinar um, and um, potentially defamation law as well, the daily rag, um, reported, or um, should I say in tabloid speak, belted, 94-year-old's wealth looted, in scare quotes, by relatives with power of attorney. Two relatives put in charge of a 92-year-old woman's finances by the Court of Protection have been allowed to get away with plundering half of her savings. The deputies, in scare quotes, uh, many of you will have noted already the um, conflict between the first line uh, and that fact, the deputies appointed by the Court of Protection to look after the finances of people who are not able to manage their own affairs had used their position to loot, in scare quotes, half of her wealth without even consulting her. Well, slightly lurid reporting aside, um, and notwithstanding that a driving force behind 
the Mental Capacity Act 2005 and the move from enduring powers of attorney, EPAs, to lasting powers of attorney, LPAs, was a desire to limit the extent to which EPAs were being used without the Court of Protection ever um, knowing about them, still less knowing that they were used correctly. The LPA regime is essentially based on trust, and it envisages limited intervention as a result by public authorities. And that's why the Law Society's practice note on LPAs, um, nearly 10 years old now, it must be said, states you should, when advising clients of the benefits of LPAs, also inform them of the risks of abuse particularly the risk that the attorney could misuse the power. You should discuss with the donor appropriate measures to safeguard against the LPA being misused or exploited. You may also notify other family members or friends who aren't named persons to be notified of an application to register it, of the existence of the power, why the attorney has been chosen and how the donor intends it to be used. This may help to guard against the possibility of abuse by an attorney and may also reduce the risk of conflict between family members at a later stage. Well, what we plan to focus on today is some of the issues that crop up um, in circumstances where there might be um, abuse going on. Um, the first way we're going to look at that, um, by way of context, though, is by reference to who it is that might come across potential abuse in an LPA context. Well, that's important because, as I say, the LPA regime operates on the basis of a fair degree of trust. And the court won't exercise its management powers, such as demanding accounts, records um, or reports for review, which it can do under Section 23 of the Mental Capacity Act, unless it's got good reason to do so. But it's only got good reason to do so if behaviour is brought to its attention. Now, the person most obviously um, best placed to know about abuse that's going on is the donor of the power themselves. But the um, dilemma at the heart of many of the issues here is, of course, that they are also singularly um, ill-placed in many instances to draw any potential abuse to the attention of the authorities or indeed to recognise it for themselves. Um, the main applicant in relation to abuse matters before the Court of Protection remains the Office of the Public Guardian, the OPG, and that's apparent from, from all of the reported cases. But it's interesting to think about what it is that prompts action by the OPG. Well, the latest report um, of the OPG um, gave these very interesting statistics. 38% of referrals to the OPG come from concerned relatives. 22% come from local authorities, and that will be through their role in the, in the, in the social care process. 10% come from solicitors. Um, which you might think actually is quite a surprisingly high number. 6% comes from uh, other attorneys and deputies, and those complaints are usually about a co-attorney or a co-deputy. And then 20% comes from the other category, which includes banks, doctors, advocates, carers, and the police. What happens then within the OPG once a referral is made? Well, the supervision division of the OPG will carry out an initial assessment, first of all, by reference to the risk to P. And that's very similar to the sort of assessment uh, of risk that takes place on any reference to social services. The matter is then referred to the compliance and regulation team. And after that, the OPG can investigate further, can consider whether to refer the matter to social services for investigation or to the police, um, or it can make an application to the Court of Protection. And that might be to revoke a power that they suspect is being abused, or it may be for interim relief, perhaps an injunction to restrain what the attorney can do while an investigation takes place. So how prevalent are these referrals and these investigations? Well, again, the OPG's annual reports are quite useful on this. Um, and it's instructive to look back over how the pattern, a pattern has emerged over the last few years. In 2016 to 2017, there were just under 1,200 investigations that took place. The next year that had almost doubled to 1,800 odd. And then in the last year for which we've got um, statistics, the total number of investigations is 2,800 plus. So the number of investigations had more than doubled in two years. Now of those, 25% result in court action, 16% result in resolution by some other method. Um, much of that will be 
um, attorneys taking a view once an investigation is launched. Um, and 59% of the investigations result in no action being taken. But that still at, at, at the 2018-2019 rates amounts to about 700 removal applications um, or um, interim relief applications being made each year. Now, against that number, the OPG would no doubt want me to point out that there are nearly 4 million registered LPAs, EPAs and deputy ship orders as of July last year. So as a consequence, um, it's a very small proportion of all of the LPAs, EPAs and deputy ships that result in any investigation at all. Still less action being taken as a result of that investigation. But that is, in one respect, hardly surprising when you think that um, the vast majority of those LPAs won't be live. They'll just be registered when people have prudently, before they've lost capacity or begun to lose capacity, decided to put in place plans for um, later in life or if they suffered a tragic event. Um, so that the 0.7% figure is 0.07% figure is perhaps um, not telling the whole story. Um, but all, uh, also, you have to look. Um, at the increased trajectory of uh, referrals and investigations that are taking place, which suggests that at least to a greater or lesser extent in the past, there was abuse going on that perhaps wasn't being investigated. Well, again, in defence of the OPG, I think the stats are mitigated in part by the high turnover of staff, which it's been undergoing for quite some time, which has no doubt been causing real challenges in the OPG's administration. Indeed, I understand that as of July last year, 60% of the staff working at the OPG have less than six months experience, which means that there is inevitably um, a, a large degree of learning on the job. Um, and against that background, though, it is perhaps a little bit surprising that last year the OPG launched this media campaign. Here you can see that front page of the leaflet that did the rounds that many of the people tuned in at the moment may have seen already. Um, the campaign referred both to health and welfare LPAs and property and financial affairs LPAs and said, we recommend you get both so you're covered for every eventuality. Then went on to say it's easy to apply online with help built in at every step. If you're having difficulty or don't have access to a computer, simply contact us and we can post the forms to you. And then, and this is really what I wanted to focus on um, before bringing Paul into the discussion, it says, if things are straightforward, you don't need to seek legal advice. And registering a lasting power of attorney is probably easier and cheaper than you think. Now, in relation to this, please don't get me wrong. It is laudable to try to get more people thinking about what would or should happen in the event that they lose capacity later in life. But I also think it's positively dangerous to encourage people to take significant legal steps without a proper understanding of them um, or necessarily without seeking advice. Um, and this, in the context of what the leaflet and the media campaign urged, might be thought particularly surprising in light of the comments made by the former senior judge of the Court of Protection, Denzel Lush, in the foreword to his latest book, the leading textbook on Court of Protection practice, Cretney and Lush. And there um, he sets out an argument, which is pretty compelling in, in my view, in favour of inappropriate cases relying on the deputy ship regime under the MCA, um, and questions earlier campaigns, which of course took place prior to this leaflet that we're looking at now, um, to promote LPAs, which in fact he went so far as describing it in that foreword as a crusade. Um, and one of the one of the issues of the leaflet, in my view, is by focusing only on the risks if you don't make an LPA. I don't think the OPG has done um, a service in um, potentially distracting people from the risks that are associated with making an LPA of the kind that the Law Society practice note suggests people looking to make an LPA should uh, be advised about. It also ignores deputy ships completely. Um, and that's unfortunate because of two particular features of deputy ships. The first is there's an obligation to um, account annually to the OPG and a deputy ship has to begin with preparing uh, an inventory of the assets and liabilities of the um, the um, protected person, um, and that can provide a helpful focal point for future accounting processes. And the second point is that when you're appointed a deputy, there is the deputy's bond or security, which means that there is um, a source of funds that can be called upon 
in the event that future abuse takes place. And that's got two benefits. One is it's a, it's a way of dissuading people from anything that could possibly be said to be abuse if they're a deputy. And also it provides a means whereby the estate of the protected person can be made whole. And there's an interesting cautionary tale in that regard um, in the case of GM uh, concerning Gladys Meek, a 94 year old widow who lived in Hainer in Derbyshire. Her late husband's niece and great niece were appointed as her deputies for property and affairs. And they went on what I can only describe as a ghoulishly splendid spending spree, uh, which involved buying a mini countryman and a Ford Fiesta for themselves, obviously, uh, an Apple laptop and a Sony laptop, Rolex watches and Omega watches, Alexander McQueen and Mulberry handbags, um, season tickets for only one football club, perhaps surprisingly, given they got twos of everything else, uh, and all the more surprisingly that it's um, Derby County they got the tickets for, and then an array of rings, jewellery, perfumes, and other presents for other family members. Well, the court looked into that, found that it had been abusive, um, unfortunately, and fortunately, was able to call in a security bond for £275,000, which just about covered the cost of their theft. And that wouldn't have been possible if they'd been Ms Meek's um, attorneys. So with that in mind, Paul, what um, views do you have about the process whereby um, you can grant a lasting power of attorney? Well, I think first I'd, I want to come back on the issue of whether the OPG is quite as ineffective or wrong as I might infer. I mean, Ed's earlier slide shows an apparently alarming statistic that it's only 0.07% of uh, registered LPAs or deputy ship orders that are investigated. And it's certainly true that, for instance, the Brunel University Doors Trust Report in 2017, looking at financial abuse of those lacking mental capacity, concluded that the OPG is largely reactive, investigating where concerns are raised, but rarely taking the initiative. And as, as Ed set out, there's no active monitoring of attorneys in contrast to deputies who do have obligations to file accounts and, and report annually. So the question is, should the OPG be doing uh, anything? Otherwise, should it be changing? And it is, I think, fair to point out that in its 2019 safeguarding strategy, it's already reduced the information it expects before it will trigger an investigation. But just as we've heard Ed implicitly, at least, criticise the OPG for being passive or ineffectual, there are examples of the court criticising the OPG for being overzealous. Uh, in JBN, a father uh, appointed his son, DN, as his uh, attorney. A desktop evaluation led the, an OPG investigator to raise concerns that DN was not acting in his father's best interests. He'd sold the father's home, transferred some of the proceeds to himself. And the OPG move very quickly it, to commence proceedings and suspend the LPA. Um, the son maintained that his father had always had capacity. And the upshot, there's obviously a great deal of detail here, but the son is reinstated and the OPG was held to have been overly aggressive in its investigation. It has sought without notice orders, adopted a standard approach to litigation, uh, contrary to the overriding objective in the Court of Protection rules, and effectively, ignored the fact that the son was cooperating. So unusually here, not only was the OPG not allowed to reclaim its costs from the father's estate, but he was actually ordered to pay 50% of the son's costs. Now you can say that hearing those facts, the way the judge saw it, that it was clear the OPG was overstepping the mark. But I do think the OPG is in a difficult position. It, it's a damned if it does, damned if it doesn't. Uh, uh, with us, mm. We uh, represented an attorney who was being investigated. Mum had appointed three children as attorneys. She lived in one of the, her children's house. He had adapted the entire house, adding in a stair lift, patio access. His sister, entirely supportive. His brother, hostile, reported our client for abuse of the finance. And the OPGA presented with the facts from the hostile brother attacked a mingling of funds because it is true that he had put his mother's funds in his own account and had funded the work to the house and the allegation was that the son had benefited from the uplift in value although query whether there was really an uplift in uh, transforming a family home into somewhere that is suited uh, for someone with mobility issues 
long letter, lots of questions, lots of detail. But in the end, OPG was satisfied that our clients had acted appropriately. But it was certainly a very unpleasant experience for him and not one that you want to put through ordinary people who are making very often huge adjustments to accommodate, look after, supervise, help elderly uh, or, or, or even the younger who've lost capacity. Interestingly, in, in that case, the OPG uh, recognized, re- recognized where the merits lay, said that there are occasions where the complaining, the complainant, uh, who is, may, may in fact be removed if they are also uh, the attorney. So there can be consequences for making unfounded allegations. But I think the point of that is simply to bear in mind how difficult it is for the OPG to sift fact from fiction, allegation from legitimate concern. But to the to the I've specific never, question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. But I was just going to jump in just to, to echo that they are in that respect in a really unenviable position, given the given the obvious funding issues they've got. And that's only made worse when you've got the turnover of staff and more resources inevitably eaten up in trying to train people up. Indeed. And I, but let, let's then turn to, to this question of whether it is too easy to apply online for LPAs. And Ed's outlined how the OPG has focused marketing on encouraging LPAs, but also there's been an encouragement to do this online. And in, in our experience at Withers, even before the current lockdown, uh, which has forced even those like me who are tech phobic to do more things remotely, uh, somewhere between 20 and 30% of LPAs were being made online. And I suspect that's simply going to increase. So it is important that we look at the way it's been done and the messaging. There are drawbacks, but equally, it, it's, it, it's simply wrong to say that there are no safeguards. Count through Dove.uk portal, fill in the forms online, but the forms still need to be printed and signed by hand before they're submitted. There are plus points in having them online. They're more accessible, more convenient to put in place. If, if they're more convenient, then hopefully more people have them, which in turn means less deputy ship applications, which I think is a positive. Because if we're honest, those are more drawn out, more expensive, and they are not necessarily guided by P's informed choice as to who P wants to manage their affairs. And digitalization should reduce the administrative burden on OPG, so should enable it to focus on other areas such as safeguarding, which is uh, exercising us on this call. On the other hand, let's bear in mind the age profile. With this is the LPAs are most likely to be made by the, those who are relatively senior and at the risk of generalization and causing offense, uh, they may be less tech literate. You could easily have a situation where a younger attorney is typing up the LP for a donor who doesn't really know its content. So I do think not going fully digital, keeping wet signatures is a, a way of preventing abuse. You have the requirement for an independent witness, you have the requirement for the certificate provider, and yes, you have those uh, occasions or the, the, the lurid examples of outright deception, somebody pretending you are of forgery and so forth. But again, my anecdotal experience is that people take the role of witness of certificate provider quite seriously. But going back to to, to the downsides of the online. Uh, system. It is quite easy to miss important information as you scroll or click through. Um, and so I, you could question whether the balance has been struck between making it accessible and user friendly and making sure important information isn't missed. And using the online portal, it's telling that I think you're more likely to end up with a vanilla LPA that doesn't contain bespoke provisions. We would be interested in advising about. Uh, the ability to transfer assets to discretionary investment managers, the ability for attorneys to make gifts for tax reasons. So in that sense, the LPA may end up not being fit for purpose, but on the other hand, maybe the people who require that level of bespoke provision are more likely to want to pay for professional advice. So perhaps the current flexibility does cater for all. The contrast, of course, with deputies is is quite uh, significant. The court there has to be satisfied before the appointment that you're suitable. 
of course, unlikely to appoint a stranger, although sadly abuse is more commonly perpetrated by someone closely connected, of course. You still have to download and fill in several forms. One of those is the assessment of capacity, so you that, that in itself is a safeguard. And you have the overseeing of the deputy's actions through the obligation to file accounts, although uh, I do flag that that uh, is a very dependent on the quality of the checks that are then um, carried out. And finally, yeah. you have the security bond based on the size of the estate in question. So there is effectively uh, a, a, an insurance policy. And if that bond is called in, you have a financial institution that has the wherewithal to chase after the defaulting person and claw back money. Question then is, as, as I think um, Ed's alluded, is whether attorneys should have similar obligations. I mean, do we say that mandatory accounts should be filed, or is it better to target resource where there's an indication of abuse? Arguably, the obligation to file accounts wouldn't add much of a burden to the duty of the attorney because attorneys should be ready to account in any event, and certainly to the personal representatives. And one of the themes of this webinar, of course, because certainty is hosting, is the relevance of the will. And I, I think that when we look at the messaging, the obligation to account on the handover when P dies to PRs is critical. And we'll, we will come back to that later. Does it make sense to make it more difficult uh, or, or, or to, to, to make a power of attorney? I, I don't think so, but I think that the, the points Ed makes about messaging, that making it a little too rosy, which is I think GOPG probably is guilty of, is something that needs to be, to be thought about. There is a balance always to be struck between safeguards and making these things easy. To draw an analogy at the moment, of course, we have calls to relax safeguards for making wills because social distancing meaning means that having two witnesses is difficult. But the requirement for two witnesses is an important safeguard against abuse. The fact, of course, is that an LPA is arguably even more important to the individual making it than their will. The will only matters when you're dead. The LPA could have huge consequences for you personally if the process isn't managed properly. On balance, I think witnessing the signature requirement for certificate provider probably means the balance is right and that we need to be looking at resourcing the OPG to better enable it to look into those when allegations and concerns uh, are, 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 exp are, are expressed. Can I break Over with you, tradition and ask you a quick question that's come up, and, but it came up uh, during the course of prepping the webinar, and that is um, Joshua Dunstone of Spire Solicitors has asked, if suspected abuse of an LPA is only discovered after the attorney has died, do the OPG or courts have power to retrospectively investigate and take action to recover the misappropriated money from the attorney's estate? I think the, the, the answer is it's not the OPG, the, but there is absolutely yeah. the ability for the person, and, and indeed I would have a, a duty on the personal representatives. If, if, I mean, if it's 100 quid, it's clearly not going to be commercially sensible, but if it's significant funds, then you would expect the personal representative to go after the defaulting attorney to make good. The, the, and that's, I think, the point I was hoping uh, to, to, to make well, uh, later on, but I'll make it now, namely that when P dies, the attorney or the deputy has an obligation to provide an account to the PRs. Very often, of course, they, they can be the same people, but the beneficiaries uh, entitlement to an account from the PR will include an entitlement to see an account of what happened pre-death. But it is interesting that that then means you have to get spilt into the Chancery Division of the High Court because at death, the Court of Protection's jurisdiction strictly terminates. And so that, that is a, it's, it's, it's not wholly procedurally straightforward to navigate through that, but Paul's, Paul's absolutely right. Thank you. I think you were going to take this foot. You were then going to press on Ed. Yeah. So, so the 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 alternative end of the process from granting the LPA is, of course, what steps you can take when things 
have gone wrong. Um, and if the protected person's still alive, then um, it may very well be that what you want to do is get a potential bad egg of an attorney or deputy out of office as quickly as possible before more harm can be done and to ensure that perhaps a fuller investigation can be taken pl can take place uh, of, of what's been going on. And I was going to look now very quickly at the courts of protection's jurisdiction to remove and replace attorneys and deputies before we're then going to look at a few more examples of abuse and some of the issues that arise from those. So if you're removing, if you're wanting to remove an attorney, whilst the donor of the power has capacity um, to revoke it, then they can revoke it at any time. Um, with capacity, you have to be very careful. There is no capacity in, in, a, in a sort of generic sense. There is only capacity to do particular acts. So the capacity to make an LPA um, is subtly different, albeit not that different, from the capacity to revoke the LPA. But both are very different, uh, potentially, from the question of capacity to actually manage one's property and affairs uh, or one's health and welfare. Um, and again, particular issues that might arise within both of those very broad categories. Um, if, however, P does not have capacity anymore to revoke a power of attorney, uh, a, a lasting power of attorney, the Court of Protection may either revoke it if it's already been registered, or if it has not yet been registered, refuse any attempt to register it under Section 22.4 of the Mental Capacity Act. But it can only step in to do that where it's satisfied that the donee of the LPA has behaved, is behaving, or proposes in the future to behave in a way that either contravenes their authority or is other than in P's best interests. Now, that's subtly different from the test that prevailed um, under the old enduring power of attorney regime, when um, the court could um, remove or replace um, the donee of an EPA if it was thought that they were unsuitable for um, the role. Now, that obviously gave the court a fair degree of um, discretion to effectively override what were the uh, wishes, the capacitor's wishes of the donor of the EPA. And so as part of the reforms of the Mental Capacity Act in 05, uh, this different test was brought in. But I've got an interesting thesis as to whether, in fact, the test that the court will apply is that different from working out whether the, in substance, from working out whether the donee of the power is in fact suitable or not. Because if it turns out they are wholly unsuitable for reason A, B or C, it's hard to see how they can be proposing to behave in a way that's consistent with P's best interests if they're proposing to carry on acting as um, attorney. But nevertheless, that's the test for, for um, removing or replacing attorneys. As regards deputies, there's a similar power. Um, the court has jurisdiction to vary or discharge in order of appointing a deputy at any time. So they can vary the powers they have. Um, they could vary the order by appointing a co-deputy, for example. The jurisdiction there um, is that the court can revoke their appointment or vary a deputy's powers where it's satisfied again that the deputy has behaved, is behaving or proposes to behave in a way that contravenes their authority or isn't in P's interests. But those are examples of um, the broader discretion to vary powers that I have um, flagged up earlier. And the reason it's a broader power is because a deputy is very much a creature of the court rather than a choice, as Paul has already commented on, of the, um, the protected person themselves. A few points to note on removal of deputies. Removing a deputy is pretty unusual. It can be sought by any interested person, including P themselves. Um, and the guideline for um, how the test should be approached um, is that set down in the case of BE and RC, which approved um, the earlier guidelines um, in Holt and the Protective Commissioner, uh, an Australian case. Um, effectively, the burden of proof is on the person who wants to seek a change to the status quo, and they normally have to show a good reason for that change. Where the deputy is unsuitable to act, um, then the, the court will terminate the appointment and replace them. But if their suitability isn't an issue or can't be proved, then you've got to show forensically that, that P's best interests are going to be in some way promoted by their replacement. And there you have all of the best interest tests that are set out in Section 4 of the Mental Capacity Act. Now, the case of BE and RC itself was pretty interesting 
because it was an application to replace a panel deputy where the panel deputy had only been appointed because of trenchant disagreements within the family. Um, the court found that replacement was in P's best interests, where the relationship between the family members and the deputy it's, that themselves had gone on to break down, such that it was going to block future administration of P's affairs. But crucially in that case, the family disagreement hadn't vanished, but it had dissipated a lot. Um, and it was felt that the family member appointment uh, in, pl in place of the panel deputy uh, was less restrictive than bringing in a brand new panel deputy who, of course, P would not have been familiar with. So a few examples of where the court has stepped in. First is Rehar Court, where an attorney had failed to cooperate with investigations by both the Court of Protection and the OPG. In C, the attorney had used the donor's property to invest in their own business. Pretty egregious, you might think. In the Public Guardian and JM, the attorney had failed to keep proper accounts or records and had made an unauthorised gift of £38,000. In the case of Public Guardian and JW, the attorney had, among other things, failed to pay care home fees and allowed a debt of £77,000 to accumulate. In the Public Guardian and AW, the donor's house had been sold, and similar to the case Paul was talking about earlier, a substantial sum of money had been used to make adaptations to um, the attorney's own home, um, and the attorney was removed, notwithstanding the donor was to live in and be cared for in their house. In Public Guardian and DNA, the attorney had failed to keep proper accounts and received over half a million pounds worth of the donor's assets. Um, and then in this case, one of two joint and several attorneys consistently tried to shut out the other attorney from involvement in P's affairs. Um, and then in the pretty sad case of SAD, the attorneys had attempted to uh, assert their authority against the donor's wishes uh, in a fairly unrelenting fashion. And that, of course, was found to be inappropriate. So um, those are instances where the court stepped in, Paul. Um, what, uh, how could referrals to the OPG um, uh, crop up in, in these circumstances? Well, I think um, Ed's slide here um, with the, the, the breakdown tells you some of the story. It's difficult usually to tell from the case reports, or very often it's difficult from the, to tell how a case uh, got to court. Relatively, relatives and friends it is not surprising because they tend to be uh, most closely uh, displaced. The next largest authority you know, category is, is local authorities, which is, I think, probably an umbrella category for different kinds of referrals, including, for instance, uh, re -E -K -E -G, sorry, re -E -G, uh, which was the elderly, elderly lady with dementia who was spotted wandering down uh, the, the road in a poorly lit area. Remember, the public contacted the Metro Police. The police contacted the borough of Bromley. The borough safeguarding team got involved and referred it to the OPG. And that's actually an interesting example of a minor incident that leads to abuse, uh, financial abuse there being uncovered. Solicitors, you would hope, would be uh, up there because we are likely to be aware of the OPG's role and its responsibilities. Um, Ed's already mentioned uh, a couple of the co-attorney uh, examples, um, the uh, particularly Rio B or the I, other also known as Public Guardian VAW, where the younger daughter was frozen out of the management of mum's finances, elder daughter was effectively acting alone, um, and the younger daughter voluntarily stepped down so that you had a deputy uh, appointed in 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 her in, in their place. I mean, other you know covers multitude of sins. You know the the, the police. Um, there are. A couple of important cases where the OPG has become aware of abuse due to uh, the attorney's failure to pay care home fees. Uh, so in, in RE-SF, Sheila, an elderly lady living in a care home uh, uh, in Herefordshire, her son, Martin, unusually in named in, 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 the, in the court because of, of his conduct, had refused to pay care home fees because he thought they should be publicly funded. Um, he actually paid quite a lot of his own money pursuing a legal action against the local health board. Um, uh, but eventually, arrears reached 29,000. Uh, concerns were raised with the OPG, um, uh, uh, and his conduct uh, was put under the spotlight. You have a similar 
case in, in uh, a, re ARL, Tony's son insisting that the care home fee should be funded by NHS Continuing Health uh, and ultimately the care home uh, attacks. I mean, I think the, cool, the judges are quite clear uh, in, so in that one, the judge said the correct course of action is to pursue the usual dispute resolution procedures while paying the fees underlined. And if you receive a refund, if it turns out the NHS or someone else should have been paying, that is the right, that's good, but it's manifestly not in the donor's best interests to leave their care home place in jeopardy through a refusal to pay the fees. And I think we, we, we want to just touch now, I think Ed and I on uh, trigger points. What are uh, the signs of, of, of abuse? Uh, and I think so care, a failure to pay care home fees indicates, uh, some, in my view, uh, on the part of uh, the attorney who is also the future, uh, it, it, it or expects to be the future beneficiary of the estate, a certain sense of entitlement uh, and a willingness to put their own interests uh, before those of their elderly parents. And so Martin, uh, son of Sheila, uh, had not only uh, refused to pay fees, but also refused to provide his mother with a personal allowance or to provide the home with an allowance to pay for toiletries. Uh, with the infamous quote in the judgment, I don't think she needs colour tinting. That kind of conduct obviously should raise suspicion. I think, Ed, you were going to talk about gifts. Yeah, gifts. Gifts is another one, and um, gifts obviously is, is one of the, the, the um, clearest ways in which the powers of, a, of an attorney can potentially be abused. The general rule is don't give gifts as an attorney, but there is a limited exception whereby you can allow it. Um, that is, if they're given in respect of customary occasions like birthdays or weddings um, to somebody who is related or connected to the donor of the power uh, or, or the person protected by the deputy chef and those gifts are of reasonable value now reasonableness is obviously context um sensitive but we're talking um generous in a, in a in a sort of layman's perspective but in the grand scheme of things relatively modest uh, sizes of you know up to 100 pounds couple of hundred pounds something like that um a crucial issue um in relation to gifts can be whether in fact the um, protected person has capacity to make the gift or not because if they do there's no power sorry to make gifts generally because if they do there's no power on the attorney to make gifts um, but you also need to be careful um, if you are, uh, are an attorney or a deputy um, and uh, vigilant if you're someone concerned about a protected person who might be being abused to take an expansive view of what a gift is so in the case of pg and dh um, the donor of a power who was likely to have lacked, lacked capacity at the time to agree to a loan that her son, the attorney, had taken out on her property, um, was was um, in, the, in that context, it was found that even if the donor had had capacity, it was reprehensible of... So firstly, sorry, I've, I've, I've not been clear. It, it, there was a question as to whether they got capacity or not. If they lacked capacity... Um, as was likely, then the loan was treated as a gift. And and the judge found that even if the donor had capacity, then it was reprehensible of um, the son to have accepted this loan as an attorney. Um, and that showed that faced with a conflict between mum's interest and his own interests, the son would have chosen his own. Um, and therefore, uh, he was removed as an attorney in those proceedings. But it's just an illustration of why you should be careful about gifts and also um, why they're a useful thing to home in on and inquire about if you're a third party concerned about the relationship between a protected person uh, and the attorney or the deputy. I think another, um, it, it, it's the question about how you know that mingling of funds is taking place is uh, obviously a, a, a real question, but where you see the mingling of funds happening, uh, then that that is a, 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 an alarm bell. So. Public Guardian and C, which, which Ed mentioned earlier, uh, where the OPG got a complaint about the attorney, uh, and it turns out that she had put 90,000 of, uh, uh, of peace money into her reptile breeding venture, but it, it's, uh, it, it, that she claimed was an investment on P's behalf, but it was in her name and into her own business. And uh, not surprisingly, the judge was at pains to make 
clear that attorneys should keep donors' property separate from their own. And if it's impossible to register an investment in the donor's name, a formal declaration of trust needs to be executed so that the beneficial interest is absolutely clear. So again, done subtly, that mingling of funds may never be, might not be noticed pre-death, but very often it, it does it does come out. There are other subtler triggers in the ARL matter, the care, other care home case I mentioned earlier. Uh, the judge found it curious that the son had instructed no fewer than six firms of solicitors to deal with legal issues supposedly arising out of the LPA. Now, some of those legitimately for the, the, the drawing up of the LPA, but then he went to a second firm for advice on his responsibilities, a third firm to pursue the NHS for continuing healthcare payments, a fourth firm to sell the mother's house and buy a flat in his own name with the proceeds, uh, and two firms of specialist drink driving solicitors um, to defend him. He was prosecuted for drink driving, I, I think, uh, arguably, when he was on the way to see his mother. But all of this at his mother's expense. And the judge said, is, I wonder whether this is a smokescreen to ensure that no one firm or company is fully aware of the extent of his ineptitude and deceit. So I think that is a, uh, a sign. As solicitors, I think we are particularly attuned to, to wonder why has our putative client come to us when they were with another firm uh, and they went with that firm for very long before, you know, pr uh, since the one before that. So that is a, a probably another another concern. I think, um, Ed, you wanted to cover off misapprehensions on the part of attorneys? Yeah, it sort of feeds nicely from what you were saying, Paul. Um, th there are, um, in my experience, various rationalizations for questionable conduct, which flow naturally from um, human beings' um, ability and need to justify what they're doing um, or what they want to do. But these are, I think, also um, important triggers that it's worth keeping an eye out for because they can be indicators that abuse can be taking place. So the first is they had capacity and said I could have the money. Well, that obviously arises in the gift context, but it can also uh, apply in respect of all manner of misuse of money, um, uh, manners of misuse of money of the kind that we've been talking about um, this afternoon. The second is they'd have wanted me to have the money if only they had capacity. It will all be mine soon anyway. So what's the problem? I deserve this for the sacrifice I'm making. And I don't say that last, put that last one out there um, too glibly, I hope, because undoubtedly huge numbers of people do make huge sacrifices to try and care for people um, who are who have dwindling uh, or no capacity. But at the same time, it, I think, homes in on um, the very difficult line that has to be drawn between protecting the interests of um, the donor of a power of attorney, the person protected by a deputyship order, and um, the very separate interests of the person that's meant to be looking out for them. So that brings us on to the final point we wanted to touch on before uh, and I'll take it fairly briskly so we have got time to move into the many questions that I've seen flowing in during the course of the present of, of the presentations and the discussion um, what are things to bear in mind if you are trying to advise someone um, in the context of potential proceedings to remove them as an attorney or to have them removed as an attorney well the first thing is bear in mind the threshold tests that I touched on earlier um, and always make sure that your uh, what you say and your investigations um, are focused on how you're going to establish that they are or are not satisfied um, in the event that this comes before the Court of Protection. In particular, as regards acting in P's best interests, bear in mind that that isn't limited to acts as an attorney or acts as a deputy that aren't in P's best interests. Um, there's a couple of cases that are on the slide there which show that it's conduct in any capacity. And that can be particularly significant where there is um, familial discord, for example, and it can be worth looking at and focusing on that. And then more generally, our message is dig, dig, dig. Think uh, imaginatively, if you can, about what the restrictions may be on what an attorney can do. Check, for example, uh, what the LPA in fact says and whether there are powers that are conferred in it for um, uh, particular uh, steps or restrictions that are it can, included in it in respect to particular strip steps. 
or whether there are powers that are conferred in the case of potential contraventions of it. Um, and also um, think about uh, investigations into things that have happened in the past, um, even if not the immediate past, because again, they can help you bolster um, a, a case of um, abuse having taken place and it not being in the best interest of P2 for this person to continue. But all all the time, bear in mind that what the Court of Protection is going to be most concerned with is looking forward rather than back and working out what is going to be necessary to stop abuse happening and to check that the uh, protected person's interests are protected as best they can be in the future. How is a replacement um, attorney or deputy going to be better placed in the future, given the issues that are going to arise um, in relation to P than the person who is currently in place? I think then it is worth uh, just coming off. There are some uh, safeguarding practice points that that are worth flagging very quickly. That, that you know the fact of having more than one attorney does provide mean there are checks and balances. They can watch each other, be accountable to each other. Uh, as a solicitor, I would obviously regard it as a very sensible thing to have a solicitor acting alongside a, a, a lay attorney. Um, when you fill in the LPA, you can specify that a third party should be notified. You can also include supervision provisions. I mean, of course, they're often not used, uh, and whether they are missed, in particularly uh, being overlooked by doing the forms online, brings us back to one of the concerns we had earlier. I, I think we've already talked about um, recovering funds, and, and obviously uh, certainty ha uh, have a, a, a great interest in whether uh, the will is, is important. I think the bullet point was, can it contribute to the forensic audit trail? And, and I certainly think that the will is indicative of intentions. If she leaves everything to me, isn't it odd that she gifted significantly to you when you were in control of her funds? Um, it's also, I think, uh, particularly in play when, when you look at the difference between an EPA and an LPA. The EPA allows gifts to those who might be expected uh, that P might be expected to provide for, including yourself. So the will, I think, potentially is very important uh, guidance. But with an LPA or deputyship, the problem about the importance of the will and the gifting is, I mean, a gift is unauthorized or, it's, you know, or it isn't. Um, Martin, the man who wouldn't pay for his mother's color tinting, assumed, knew that he was going to benefit under the will and therefore he wasn't going to spend any money. So I think the will is part of the factual matrix. Sometimes it may lend itself to ratification of uh, unauthorized gifts. Sometimes it may lend itself to a statutory will application to rectify uh, uh, something that improper that has happened. Um, and it's also worth bearing in mind that the Law Society guidance makes clear that a financial attorney is the client's agent and the will forms part of the property and financial affairs which the agent is authorized to manage. And as such, the will, we, the solicitor, if we're holding the will, can disclose it to the attorney or deputy unless there's an instruction to the contrary within that document or the court order, or there is a genuine cause for concern as to which the Law Society does give some guidance. But I come back to the point I made earlier on, that I think the mere fact of the will's existence held by a third party is an important aspect in tempering the temptation uh, on an attorney or deputy uh, to, uh, to, to misbehave, provided they understand that someone else will have the right to look at what they have done. There should be an account, and that goes back to the question that was made earlier, and I think it also goes back to whether the messaging is sufficiently clear. I agree. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I agree. And just, just to be clear, the National Will Register doesn't remove um, former wills or codicils, so that's part. That's why it forms part of the um, audit trail for forensic purposes. It's just a new type of for a, uh, forensic element, um, and and I think it's very important in this case. We have actually been approached in the past. Um, Obviously, we, we don't divulge any information to um, third parties, but we have been uh, contacted by, say, members of the police force. So I think that the National Will Register has just um, morphed into um, 
a repository that actually helps in cases like this. Um, as Ed has just said, we've had lots and lots of questions in. Ed, do you want to take some of them? Yeah, absolutely. We've got a bit of time left, so let's um, let's delve into them. Excellent. Do you want me to select, or would you like to select? I'm, I'm very easy. I'm just I'm opening the very, very helpful screen that's 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 got them in here. Um, I'm going to read the first one out and ping it towards Paul, um, and then I'll pick out another one and digest it while he's answering it. There's a question yeah. from Emma Fuller at EHL Solicitors. If the attorneys financially abuse the donor, and this has been confirmed in criminal proceedings, the donor's lost capacity so cannot change her will. The abuser was a beneficiary in the will, but the donor dies before the criminal proceedings have been concluded. Will the attorney still benefit under the will? If the finding was made before the donor dies, should a statutory will be applied for? Well, I, I think the, the, the answer probably is yes there in the question, which is if you know the will is still going to be valid and, until such time as it's set aside. So the, the potential uh, remedies are either that will or if there is a money claim against the defaulting uh, uh, attorney, then they, they obviously they have to account for that, and that can be, that that may be being taken account uh, taken into account uh, during the estate administration. Yeah, and and pivoting off that, so Holly Meva Hawkins from Enable Law um, has helpfully flagged that she understands the LPA practice note from the Law Society is being reviewed at the moment. Um, I, I wonder, but she can't answer whether she's involved in that review at all. Um, and James McMullen at RAA Barker Gillette has said if P has made a will prior to the deputyship order, but there's some doubt over his capacity to have made that will, does the COP have jurisdiction to order a statutory will, or is the matter for the Chance Division of the High Court to determine the validity of that will? Well, I think the answer to that probably turns on when the issue arises. If during the lifetime of the testator um, the issue crops up, then it will be open to the Court of Protection to make a statutory will. Um, of course, if it's after death, then you're going to have to go to the Chancery Division and, and, and someone is going to have to challenge or prove the validity of the will in question. Um, I, mean, I think there is an argument, Ed, isn't there, that it is in P's best interests for this dispute to be resolved before they die in the rather weird way that we have to apply best interests to the making of a statutory will, which is a, sort of it stretches into the intellectual um, well, the, 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 the definition of best interests doesn't really fit with will making, but uh, we, it's a fiction that we have become used to. Indeed. I, um, and it, it, it does just very quickly provide an answer to the, um, the, the issue that often crops up in probate proceedings, which is that the best witness, i.e. the testator, testatrix, uh, isn't there. Even if they've lost capacity, there is scope to discern something of evidence from them that, that can be used. Thank you. Um, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap things up. That, this has been fascinating. And from all the questions that we've seen, we can see how important it is for a lay uh, attorney or deputy to, to seek legal advice. This is just too important, uh, too important a matter. So um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank both Edward and Paul for their very lively um, presentation of, of this webinar. Thank you so much. And could I just end uh, by telling you all that the um, next Certainty Expert webinar will be presented by Tom DeMont QC, Barrister at Radcliffe Chambers, entitled Execution of Wills, Especially in a Lockdown. And that will be on the 21st of May at midday. So thank you all very much for your time and for registering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay. Hi all. Hiya. One moment. Just trying to share link it. Okay. Mm -mm. I take it we're off air now. <laughs>